So maybe we should start. Um, welcome everyone to this second conference that's following the first conference by Laurent Polidori last week. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you here that you accepted to do these two conferences. As you know, those who attended the first conference, Laurent Polidori is an international, an internationally recognized expert in remote sensing. And we're happy that you speak with us about the links that we can do to social uh, sciences analysis using this kind of data. So thank you very much, Laurent. And everyone, please ask your questions in the chat and we can then interrupt and let you ask your question. Okay, thank you for this uh, introduction. I hope ev everybody can hear me uh, correctly. So uh, this is the second part of my presentation on spatial remote sensing dedicated to social geography. And uh, just to remember what I presented last time, uh, I, I, I try, to, try to show the benefits of remote sensing um, for um, man-made trace detection, which means to detect uh, not, not people, which is uh, very difficult and not very interesting, but to detect the traces left by people. And if you remember, I, I mentioned a, a, a list of criteria that uh, indicate the presence of uh, human occupation that satellite could uh, to some extent to see and, and map. So in the list of criteria, some of them was uh, related to uh, the color or what exactly what the satellite is measuring. Another list of criteria was uh, related to the pattern and 2D or 3D pattern, the spatial organization of, the, of the, the traces, which may be different between human traces and natural traces. And if you remember, I left a third uh, category of, of criterion uh, for today. And this category of criterion, uh, I call uh, environmental parameters here is not what the satellite is measuring, is some uh, relevant uh, characteristics of the, of the environment, something which is meaningful on the ground uh, that the, the satellite is not able to, to, to measure, but that we can correlate with the satellite measurement. So I will see several examples of this kind of parameter. I just want to stress that this, what I call here parameter, is an uh, indirect uh, estimation of some characteristic. And I will give the example of population density, which is something that obviously the satellite is not able to estimate, but that we can correlate to some characteristics on the ground, uh, which are uh, actually uh, accessible from satellite imagery. And I will see some applications of uh, uh, operational land cover mapping, which is because uh, traces on the ground uh, can, can uh, urban occupation can be seen in land cover mapping. And uh, the way the limitation of land cover mapping, I will, I will show that they are mainly related to the limitation of a concept that I defined last time, which is spectral signature, which is the way the surface behaves uh, with regards to light reflection. And uh, with this limitation, I will show that one of the way, what, what, one of the most interesting ways to, to overcome this limitation is to take into account the temporal dimension, is to show how uh, things behave uh, Along, along the time. And to conclude, I will show how uh, remote sensing is uh, implemented in uh, operational terms in uh, the typical environment, which is the geographic information system. So this is more or less uh, an overview of what I'm going to show now. And uh, to begin with, I'm continuing uh, the list of criteria of human, applica application, human occupation, sorry. And uh, speaking of environmental parameters, I want to show here that uh, this kind of parameter, which is uh, anything meaningful on the ground, I show uh, here below uh, three categories that I call geophysical parameter, biological parameter, and social parameters, some characteristics of the ground, which are not directly uh, measurable by satellite, but that to some extent they can be correlated to some remote sensing measurements. So um, there are two uh, conditions. The first one is to choose the right sensor. Uh, so it, which is able to measure something which can be correlated with the uh, parameter which, are, uh, which we are considering. And the other aspect is to be able to model with a mathematical equation, to model the relationship, the correlation between the, the input measurement and the parameter we want to study to map. And uh, the elaboration of the mathematical model can be based on both theoretical consideration because we have some theoretical knowledge of, of, about the, the, the phenomenon and also the adjustment on existing data, which has, uh, we can be collected in some, in some places. And in most cases, we have both, uh, both uh, contributions of theory and observation to build uh, models, uh, which can be used uh, on, 
and it, to some extent extrapolate, extrapolated to the region. Uh, so if I consider that uh, three kinds of uh, uh, which is uh, described uh, Logical, which means that they describe the, mainly the vegetation. I will also show an example on uh, mosquitoes, which is kind, kind of biological, uh, biological phenomenon, and social parameters, which is the characteristics of this the earth surface in terms of human human occupation. The general uh, the general tendency is that uh, for geophysical parameters, we have a very uh, highly adjusted correlation. And on the contrary, poor cor correlation from, uh, in the case of social parameters. And this has an impact on reproducibility. It means that if, I, if I'm able to establish a model uh, to correlate a satellite measurement with some geophysical parameter, the characteristics of the atmosphere, the ocean, uh, the snow, and so on, uh, if I establish a model in France, it's, it's very highly uh, probable that I will be able to apply the same model in Australia or Japan uh, on the contrary, on the other side of the, the this flow chart, on the other side, uh, for a social parameter, if, if I'm able to, to establish a correlation between, uh, for, for instance, population density and some characteristic on the ground in terms of uh, human traces, probably it will not be relevant. America or, or, or Africa. So uh, the the. Um, the approach may be similar, but uh, we will have to uh, re uh, reconstruct the, the models. So uh, to show some examples uh, here, uh, to begin with geophysical parameters, I can show here this, uh, above the sea surface temperature, which is obtained from heat emission. Heat emission is directly measured uh, from, from satellite in the, in the relevant wavelengths. And uh, we can obtain maps of sea surface temperature, which are meaningful for, for fishery, for, for climate study, for many, uh, many applications. And the, in this case, the equation which relates the satellite measurement in, the, in thermal infrared with the sea surface temperature, the equation is something highly reproducible, which means that we are able to apply the same equation all over the world. The second example is elevation. Different sensors uh, provide uh, information which can be processed to derive elevation. And this is also something which could, can be established. The, the method uh, can be calibrated, validated uh, in France, for instance, and applied any, anywhere in the world. Uh, they have their default. I'm not saying that they are very accurate, but uh, they are uh, easy to reproduce from one place to another one. In the case of uh, biological parameters, I will show uh, here two uh, or three examples. In this example, we have forest biomass. Uh, you see uh, on, the, on the right of the screen, uh, the scale color, which represents the relationship between the color and uh, an interval of, of forest biomass uh, in ton per, per hectare. And this, is, uh, this can be measured from the, the satellite. In this case, it's a radar satellite, which measures the intensity of the radar echo. And this radar echo uh, uh, brings back to the antenna uh, an information which is highly correlated to the forest biomass. So the, 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 there are some equations that can be uh, calibrated, validated in some places of the world, and to some extent, uh, to some extent, extrapolated to other places. But uh, I, as I said before, this extrapolation is not so good as in the case of geophysical parameter because the vegetation is not so uh, um, does not obey uh, universal rules like uh, like uh, uh, geophysical environments. So this is forest biomass in, in Amazonia, in South America. So it's an indication of forest degradation. And this example is vegetation density. So uh, this, in this case, uh, at each date, I have uh, an image of a parameter called, called leaf area index. This index is the number, uh, the total, uh, total area of leaves, of vegetal, vegetal, vegetation leaves per uh, square meter. It means the parameter is three. It means that every square meter on the ground, I have in the column above this square meter, I have a total of three square meters of leaves. So this is an indication of the vegetation density. And this can uh, be used in models for, uh, for instance, uh, harvest forecasting. So this is a, a parameter which can be related to uh, optical imagery, which is the satellite measurement. And uh, we can 
compute and map this, this parameter as shown in this slide. Uh, also in the field of biological parameters, I wanted to show something from the animal world, uh, which is the aggressivity of uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, which are the transmitters of malaria. So it's important in some places, this is the, the border between uh, Gu French Guiana and Suriname, this is Amazonia. There are here some villages and I wanted to show um, uh, a work that uh, done by a student uh, a few years ago, which consisted in looking for an indicator which, was, uh, which we, was, we were able to measure by satellite and to co correlate with the, uh, what they call aggressivity of mosquitoes. Uh, it, it works the, in the following way. Somebody is uh, a person will stay a whole night uh, trying to catch uh, mosquitoes and the number of mosquitoes caught in one night is an indicator of the aggressivity of mosquitoes, which is some, uh, somehow the probability you will have to be uh, attacked by a mosquito. So it's, a, it's an empirical indicator. Um, and the, the, the parameter which is considered, the, 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 sorry, the satellite measurement which is considered is the density of the cloud cover. So it's, it's very easy to know uh, for one place uh, if, uh, if we have cloud or not. So uh, we can study along the year, uh, along the, year the, 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 the series of time cover and we can correlate it with uh, this kind of information, which is the number of mosquitoes in, in three villages here, the numbers of, of mosquitoes that were caught by somebody. And uh, the time series is relevant and can be correlated to some extent to the uh, cloud cover time series. So here, the percentage of clouds in the region appears as a function of time. And uh, in the red curve is the number of, uh, of mosquitoes caught in one night, one night. Uh, which is called aggressivity of the mosquito. And we see that there is not a very, very strong correlation, but there is some correlation. And this is uh, on the right, the correlation, between, uh, the correlation between the aggressivity of the mosquitoes and the percentage of cloud cover. So the idea is that uh, if we can, we cannot observe the mosquito aggressivity every day, it's a lot of work, and we cannot observe it everywhere because it's impossible to be everywhere. So the idea is, is to use this correlation to extrapolate uh, the values that are measured uh, in some places and extrapolate the, uh, what is called here the uh, mosquito aggressivity uh, with the number here of a mosquito, uh, mosquito attack per night. And then we have it here in the, in the wet season uh, in, in May and here in the dry season in November. So this is an indication. Of course, it's more meaningful near the places where the, the experiment was, was made, but it's an interesting uh, way to, uh, to map and to, to, to display a parameter which is not uh, directly accessible from satellite measurement or not for any, uh, any kind of uh, observation method. So this is a second example. And uh, now I'm moving to social parameters. And the example I want to take uh, first is population density. So the, the question is, how can, you, how can we use uh, the human occupation, uh, the human traces uh, visible in satellite imagery to have an estimation of population density. So we need, once again, to choose an observable indicator. Uh, in this case, the observable indicator in this first example is building density. Uh, I, I recognize that this, this is a poor indicator because I don't know how many people live in each house. But uh, if I take this square, this yellow square, this is one, kilometer, one square kilometer. I, I guess that there are more people living uh, in this square, number one, than in the square number two. So uh, intuitively, we can think that the building density is uh, to some extent an indicator of population density, but uh, we will probably not be able to derive the universal model uh, to, 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 compute, uh, to compute population density just based on this indicator. So probably we think that uh, it will be necessary in each region of the world uh, depending on the kind of urbanization of the law, the, the, the real estate market, and so on, we will have a correlation which will be different from one country to another one. And then uh, probably we'll have to uh, adjust this, this model on uh, some uh, real observation. So this is an example of a study that uh, was done a few, a few years ago by my group when I was working in French Guyana. We made a study in two cities, a small city, which is Cayenne, uh, uh, 50,000 uh, people, and the big city, uh, which is Belém, where I'm, I'm working and living now, which is about uh, 2 million people. So in these two cities, we have satellite images, and as I, as I already showed uh, last time, 
uh, we clearly see that uh, the transformation of natural environment like forest or, or wetland into uh, populated area uh, changes um, changes clearly the, the 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 color of the image. So that is it's quite true. It's quite easy to evaluate the number of, of uh, the, for each pixel if it was or not uh, changed from natural environment to uh, to built uh, built uh, urban environment. So it's easy to have a, a land cover map with a binary land cover map with uh, some uh, urban objects like uh, houses or, and so on, or natural uh, natural environment. So based in this uh, based in this segmentation between two two worlds, natural and human, uh, this is an intermediate product which is a building density. Which means that for each pixel, for each pixel of the images here, a pixel is 30 meter, 30 meter by 30 meter. So it's not high resolution. I cannot distinguish one uh, one single house and uh, even less uh, people. So in uh, in watch in each pixel of thirty by thirty meters, here I, I I have an indicator which indicates the density of buildings in a buffer around this pixel. In this case, in this case, it's a diameter of two hundred meters in order to make uh, the dense the, the 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 indicator more meaningful and to avoid uh, taking uh, giving. Um, giving much information to a single pixel, so in single isolated pixel. So in this case, for each pixel, we have a density of buildings around this pixel, and we have two maps uh, for each city of this uh, density indicator, but density of buildings. Now, I'm not able to derive the population density without some data, and these data were taken from census uh, in, the two, in the two cities uh, for each neighborhood. Obviously, we did not access for confidentiality uh, matter uh, the, the very uh, high resolution information. But for every neighborhood, we could access some uh, some information about population density. And the result was uh, based on the correlation between the building density and the correlation density, uh, a correlation which was which was uh, adjusted in uh, based on the, the 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 neighborhood for which we had the population density available. This is a uh, population density indicator, okay? And uh, the result for the two cities showing uh, the data what, that were used show that uh, we had a correlation which is not so, um, not so bad. We can see that the correlation is better for a smaller town like Cayenne, and this was observed in, in other cities. And uh, our explanation is that uh, in, a, in a big city, there are two causes. And we see, uh, and, and we see that some some uh, some areas are far from the model. That probably in uh, in some cases we have more uh, more people than expected through the uh, building density indicator because we have high building, and if a building has uh, uh, ten floors or twenty or thirty floors, the satellite is not able to see. So there there are more people, more people, but uh, this gives the same image because the building had the same horizontal site size. On the contrary, we may have some areas with very large buildings, which are not uh, places where people live, uh, large buildings like, like uh, shopping and, and uh, industrial buildings. The, the algorithm will, will uh, easily conclude that there are many people living, and this is a bias of the method, because no people are living in, in very, uh, a building of 100 by 100 meters with no windows, Generally, no people are living, so these buildings are these neighborhoods are, are far from the model in the other side. So in big cities, uh, it does not work so well. So the quality of the correlation is is not so bad because of the the, the quantity of of, uh, of information. Um, and we can see here that uh, in fact, in the agglomeration in the the, the 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 urban region of Cayenne, we have three three. Uh, Municipal municipalities and Cayenne, which is the big the biggest one, we have uh, both uh, more people and a higher uh, building density indicator. The others, uh, the the others, the others are um, uh, residential areas with a lot of vegetation. So it's uh, it's coherent to observe this this result here. Okay, so this is just an example. Uh, another indicator that can be used. Uh, I've just shown a building density as one indicator of population. Another indicator is nightlife density. So I've just, I've already shown this kind of information uh, last week. This is an observable indicator. Uh, I've already shown that the, the DMSP satellites, the, the, the American military satellite for the meteorological program can be used at night in optical wavelengths to observe night lights. And, uh, 
everybody can uh, recognize that here we have an indicator of population density and uh, some other characteristics that uh, distinguish uh, rich countries and poor countries, for instance. So this is not a very good indicator. It may be a good indicator within one country with the same, uh, the same uh, uh, standard of living, but uh, extrapolating the same model from, uh, uh, from Florida to uh, Central Africa is probably uh, not, very, not very clever. So we can see what, uh, what can be done in one country and probably not uh, to extrapolate to the, the, all over the world. Uh, this is an example of the study published by some uh, Brazilian colleagues a few, a few years ago. So uh, here we have, based on the, the, of these uh, nightlight images, on the top we have uh, the percentage of uh, cloud-free uh, images. So when, uh, when it's black, it means that we have a lot of clouds so that uh, during the year we don't have many images which are cloud-free, but this is a condition because if we are clouds, you cannot, uh, you cannot make the, the, you cannot look for the, your, your indicator. And uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the contrast is very poor. We should see more things. We should, should see smaller cities. Here we have Belém and here we have Manaus, but the smaller cities do not appear clearly. This is simply uh, the result of uh, um, a threshold for the, 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 the places where uh, we had um, the number of, of bright pixels was higher than the threshold within uh, the series of cloud-free images. So uh, in this study, the, these people uh, made something interesting. They, uh, they calibrated their, their model based on two dates, the night light images of two years, uh, 95 and 99, and they calibrated with uh, some uh, population density information, uh, not exactly the same date, but almost the same date, 96 and 2000. And based on the model that they established, they tried to uh, validate their method using Another, um, another date, a third date. So this is just a ranking of the, 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 size, uh, the size of the cities in terms of night, um, night light. So the two bigger cities are here. And then for all cities, you can see the, the distribution of the different sizes. And you can see that obviously uh, um, the cities are bigger uh, or at least they have more light uh, switched on uh, in 2000. In, in, 2002, then in 1995, 96. So um, this is my, the, the data they use. And uh, this is the calibration that was done uh, with and without the big capitals, which, which are, uh, have a very, very big weight. So they, they removed the four big capitals uh, to have something more representative of the variety of towns. And based on this model and on the the, 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 the counting of the number of pixels, of, of, of bright pixels of each city. And uh, so for each city, the number of pixels was correlated to the sen demographic census. And then the result, uh, I did not find the, the, the R square in, the, in their publication, but the results is the, 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 the correlation of the, the, their method. We can see that it overestimates, uh, the, the, this, is the, the, this is the identity right, uh, line. They overestimate the population density, so this is not perfect, but this is a way to estimate the population density uh, with a very cheap, uh, cheap method. And this is the, another uh, work that was published by another group. And uh, here, which is interesting, that they took a lot of cities all over the world, so there is a very, very big uh, diversity. As I already said, it's very difficult to have the same model all over the world. And they, in order to avoid the bias, they distinguished uh, low income, medium income, and high income uh, countries. Okay, and um, this, is, this shows that uh, the, the, the population density, uh, the, the relationship can be, uh, the, the, this difficulty to reproduce the model uh, can be solved by separating different categories of countries. Maybe uh, if you establish a model in a poor country, maybe you can apply it in other poor country. Okay, so, but this is very poor cor correlation. And uh, as I tried to show at the beginning, it's very, uh, it's much easier to extrapolate geophysical uh, parameter modeling than uh, social parameter modeling. And uh, just to conclude about uh, uh, night light uh, information and these, these, their application, I took this from a very interesting paper uh, that made a review, an extensive review of publications 
uh, of work published uh, using this data for a lot of socio-economical uh, parameter modeling. And uh, you see here the main, the main categories and the number of publications. This gives an idea of the, the, the main application of this uh, night light information. And this is very interesting, but you can see something about uh, urban, uh, urban studies, uh, energy, uh, demography, other socioeconomic parameters, uh, traffic, and, and so on, poverty and the extra capital income. So it's a, it's a poor correlation, but it's, a, it's an, available, uh, uh, an available information which is free of charge. So maybe it's interesting to consider this kind of information for, for some studies. And, and uh, this is just the, the, the top 10 uh, list of publications uh, in terms of uh, citation. And once again, you can see the, the, the kind of application which are carried out with this, uh, this data. So that, uh, but with, this, with all these applications, I would, I would like to make some biases. Yes, uh, he's asking for the, for the reference of the previous paper. Oh, I did not put the reference. Okay, I did not put. So I, I, I have, I can, I can find it again. Uh, no, no problem. I think there are not so many. It's this kind of review, review paper, there are not so many. So I, it will not be so, so difficult. Uh, from all these studies, obviously, I did not read everything, but I read a few, some, some papers, uh, and uh, some systematic error uh, errors occur uh, in, in most studies, and they contribute to make this the the the. the, the the modeling of the, uh, the parameter uh, difficult to reproduce from one place to, to another one. Uh, some biases are the type of lighting, because in some cities uh, they are careful about the kind of lighting in order to, to uh, illuminate only the ground and not the sky. Uh, the need for light, because in some cases uh, you don't need light. Uh, some activity need light if we consider that the street or where many people are, are, are of many people, maybe the need for light will be higher. Uh, another uh, bias is the verticalization. I already mentioned about uh, the, other, uh, the other indicator, which is the building density, verticalization. We, when we have very, very high buildings, it's very difficult to conclude about the lights which are switched on in the streets. Uh, also, uh, it's important to take into account when possible the practices or the policies in terms of energy saving, because this is a tendency in the, the past years to try to, uh, to avoid uh, uh, wasting a lot of, uh, of, uh, of light, of energy, and also the color of the ground surface, because if the ground surface is very clear, I, uh, I've already shown this last week, if the, 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 the ground of the, the, the streets and, and, and parkings and so on is very clear, so this will contribute to the night light that is measured by the, by the satellite. So there is an ind indirect lighting, which is uh, which can influence also uh, the, the, the intensity of the light that uh, we are likely to measure from the sky. Um, now, another indicator of, uh, of uh, population density. I did not see uh, work published on, with this indicator uh, in uh, quantitative terms. I just saw uh, geographic work, uh, but more in qualitative terms which is to consider uh, the extent of cultivated area in rural areas. This is a small village in Amazonia. And uh, many people uh, live for, uh, take their food from uh, small, uh, small cultivated parcels, parcels. So that intuitively it's uh, obvious and it's observed in satellite imagery and in all, also in old aerial imagery. It's, uh, it's typically observed that when the population increases, the number of hectares uh, cultivated around the village also increases. So this can give an estimation of the population. But once again, I, I did not show, I, I did not see a practical application with quantitative, quantitative information. So this kind, this is uh, the previous one was uh, airborne. This was in satellite, uh, satellite images. Image. If we are able to map uh, the extension of cultivated areas, which is not so difficult, and to uh, um, compare this, uh, the total area to the population, uh, maybe we can have to some extent an estimation of the population density. But, but Laurent, how can you, like, is there a way to have an idea of the soil productivity? Because the same kind of result could be there if you have constant no. production, but it's no. not it, po possible it's to grow anything. No, no. No, not, not, direct, not easily, not efficiently. Uh, very efficiently, I can tell you the number of hectares. But you can have some, some places where the agriculture is very, 
very efficient uh, with the high productivity. So the one hectare will feed uh, 20 people and, and other, place, other places because they don't have money to, to, to buy uh, uh, chemical products or, or machines. Uh, one hectare will, will feed uh, five people. So it's, this is one of the reasons why I'm saying from the beginning that uh, social parameter like population density or, or others are very difficult to extrapolate. I mean, the model that you use to relate it to a satellite measurement is very difficult to correlate, to, uh, sorry, to, um, to reproduce from uh, one area of the world to another one. So the same approach can be implemented, but you have to calibrate again in local data. Okay, thank you. Uh, a similar approach, uh, a similar approach to heat emission as an indicator of economic activity. So once again, it's very indirect, difficult to reproduce to one area uh, to another. But this is in China. Uh, this is in China. And in red, there is a, a threshold of heat, uh, heat emission uh, measured by satellite and superimposed over an optical image. Optical image, which is just to show uh, the urban area. This is in China. If you, if you look at the dates, uh, January 2020, this was the lockdown in China. China was the first country at the beginning of the pandemics to, to, um, to organize a, a mandatory lockdown in, uh, in their cities. And in February, end of February, people were already uh, going back to work. So that the, uh, resuming the economic uh, activity had a consequence in terms of uh, heat emission. Once again, it's a very poor correlation. It's very difficult to, to relate this to some uh, economic parameters, but at least you have a visual information. You can have the number of, of hectares and so on. So um, um, I, just, I just picked this in a publication that I found in the internet. I'm not able to speak in detail on, of, on this, but I just wanted to show that once again, in this field of application, you can correlate something which is uh, easy to measure from satellite with uh, a very indirect uh, environmental parameters, which is in, in this case an economical parameter, which is uh, industrial uh, activity. And this is the same work at the scale of uh, almost whole, whole, the whole uh, the China, the whole country on the, the Eastern part. And you see that uh, more or less in the same date, uh, end of January and day, end of February, people went back to work and uh, this led to uh, an increase of uh, Economic activity and this led to an increase of heat emission as detected by by satellite. Okay, so uh, all all this uh, as shown until now. Uh, on the contrary, uh, this is different from uh, what I've shown uh, last week, which was a direct measurement of uh, uh, roughness and color or some uh, direct measurement of uh, human traces. Here I saw indirect measurements. So all these measurements. Uh, show that it's possible to make remote sensing with that, without using the famous spectral signature, which is the, which is the dominant concept. And uh, I, want, I would like to say a few words about uh, spectral signature and to speak of, this, of its limitation. Because this concept is a physical concept. It's, uh, I would say, the dogmatic way of, way of uh, carrying out projects in remote sensing for, for decades. From the very beginning, remote sensing is uh, developed by physicists for physicists, and the, 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 the universal way to con uh, official way to make some remote sensing is to relate a physical measurement to uh, a parameter uh, directly. All what, has, uh, what I'm showing here is not going through uh, spectral signature. Spectral signature is describes is this curve here uh, on the top, this curve for one kind of surface. Uh, spectral signature describes the way this surface behaves in terms of uh, light reflection for all wavelengths, which is a horizontal axis. And then uh, generally uh, sensors, uh, satellite sensors are designed uh, taking um, into consideration the spectral signature in order to decide what kind of, what kind of wavelengths we are going to, to, uh, to measure to be able to detect uh, the different kinds of vegetation, soil, water, uh, atmosphere, and so on. So the variety of optical sensors, which may be panchromatic, which is when just we have just one uh, one spectral band, multispectral, when we have several uh, spectral bands to be able to re to, to originate uh, color information, or even hyperspectral, when we have many many spectral bands, uh, for instance, 200, 300, to be able to uh, 
to uh, determine with the high spectral accuracy the, the, the spectral signature. So this is interesting to answer some questions. For instance, I, I just show here two examples, uh, spectral signature of, of the ocean, the water, the spectral signature of the water generally uh, falls down like this and becomes very, very low. But in the presence of high concentrations of uh, phytoplankton, we have this shape, these typical shapes, which uh, with the height here, which is an indicator of the uh, phytoplankton concentration. So this is an, an interesting information. This is a direct information, not, 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 a, not, direct, not indirect at all. And this, in this other example, I can see that uh, I show here uh, vegetation with um, two different uh, water contents in the leaves. So that uh, when, la when water is missing, which is a, a problem because the, the, the vegetation, the plant can die. This is a serious problem for ecology and uh, agriculture. Uh, I, can, uh, I cannot be able to see, it, to see it in the visible spectrum. But in the infrared, in the medium infrared, I can already see that there is some problem. So a spectral signature can, can tell me that for this kind of problem, it will be a good idea to have on board a future satellite uh, a measurement in this wavelength. Okay, so this, this information is interesting for, for the physical behavior of the surface in terms of uh, light reflection or uh, emission. But I would like to show some limitations. The first one is the influence of environmental conditions. In, the, uh, in this first example, I have uh, the spectral signature of a kind of soil, and I have two levels of roughness. So the same soil, the same uh, material, the same geochemical content of the soil will, will not give the same spectral signature. So this, is, this means that uh, the, 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 the relationship uh, between the signature and the object is not absolute. Uh, same thing with the moisture. Higher moisture, the color is not exactly very different. Huh? You have more or less the same shape, but uh, after the rain, typically all objects become uh, darker and this appears in the difference of the two spectral signatures. Another, uh, another uh, example I want to show in terms of limitations is the influence of observation conditions. Let's think of a forest cover. Uh, same species of trees, same height, same, same soil here, same geometry, same density. I mean, everything uh, homogeneous, which means that uh, I would expect to have the same signature everywhere. However, uh, it's easy to understand that when the, 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 the satellite of the aircraft is flying over this forest, uh, the sensor will see here between the trees and will see the, the, the lower trees and maybe the soil so that the, 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 the reflectance will not be the same one, while uh, on, the, on the both sides, on the borders of the image, we will, will not see between the trees, we will see only the crowns of the trees. And here I will see the, the illuminated side of the crowns because I show here the sun illumination direction. And here I will see the shadows of the trees. So that uh, in three parts of the same image, uh, in spite of having the same trace, forest, I will have different, three different responses. So the impact, if, if, if I show here a mosaic of uh, aerial photographs in Amazonia, I can see that here the, there is the, exactly the limit between two images of the mosaic. And the difference between both is that uh, the observation geometry and maybe uh, the hour of the day because the sun, the sun position change is not the same. So that I'm not able to, to say that this, uh, this, uh, for, this piece of forest is different from this piece of forest because maybe it's not so different. Okay, so these are examples. Uh, and I will show some other examples. Uh, but first of all, I would like to, uh, to illustrate these, exam these limitations based on uh, the, the concept of land cover mapping. Land cover mapping is usually uh, made using uh, supervised classification, which is the name of this the, the, the image uh, process. How does it work? It's supervised classification in its very, very classical uh, method uh, with uh, using data and some uh, training samples. In the case of uh, satellite images, I have a set of images of, in several uh, wavelengths, uh, visible, infrared, and so on. Here, I just took the example of red and infrared, and I, I collect on the ground a few samples of um, well-known uh, well land cover. For instance, vegetation, soil, and water. I go to the, to the field 
And I observe in some places where I have vegetation, where I have soil, and where I have water. So if I represent here the 2D, uh, the 2D plot between infrared measurement and red measurement, uh, I know that vegetation is very uh, dark in the red wavelength and very bright in the infrared wavelength, so that all the vegetation pixels will be in this part of the 2D histograms. Water is dark in both uh, wavelengths. Soil is, uh, is medium intensity in the infrared and higher intensity in the red. So I have a previous knowledge of where uh, different samples are likely uh, to be in the 2D uh, histogram, but I have the ground truth so that I'm, I'm sure that here is vegetation, here soil and here water. So based on this example, I'm going to make a partition of the uh, 2D histogram so that I'm going to decide to, to to divide the, 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 the radiometric space, the spectral space into uh, classes. So any pixel, any pixel that I did not measure on the ground, uh, which falls in this class will be identified as vegetation, here as soil and here as water. So based on this, it's easy uh, to, 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 uh, um, to decide which land cover is uh, every pixel based on the similarity from, with the training samples. So this is the classical way of uh, uh, do some uh, land cover mapping with the satellite imagery. So this is an example of the land cover map, which is published by, by CESBIO, which is the, my, my former lab in Toulouse, uh, based on the cloud-free reflectance, which is computing for whole France. Uh, the cloud are removed uh, with the time series. It, uh, when we have uh, one image every week, we, we look for uh, we look for, an for each pixel, we look, we look for a date in which we don't have cloud so that we are able to make a mosaic uh, which is cloud free. And in, based on this mosaic with several uh, wavelengths, here I just show two, but we may have uh, 10 or 12 wave wavelengths. We use, uh, uh, in the last years, we have been using the Sentinel-2 satellite, which offer more than 10 wavelengths, so that we have, uh, as a result, um, a land cover map of, uh, of the whole country, which is published every year. So this is used for uh, uh, agriculture or for, for, for different applications that needs to have an up-to-date information every year. What I want to show uh, here is that this map, which is reproduced here, um, is based only on spectral signature and on some, uh, some samples on the ground, a ground truth based on some, some well-known samples. What I wanted to show that uh, the, the errors of this map, because it's not perfect, it's, one, it's not 100 perfect. We take some samples, I, I, I forget to say that uh, um, we don't only take samples for training, we also, also take samples for validation and we uh, compare the results with the, the validation samples. And this will give for, for based on different possible quality indicators that we have maybe 80% uh, uh, Eighty percent uh, reliability, or ninety, or when uh, when a researcher uh, finds a small change in the algorithm to move from eighty to eighty-five percent, so there is a, a new publication. So this is a very typical, very classical work for for remote sensing people. Uh, what I wanted to show that in this kind of uh, work, there are two uh, very very interesting information that mo most often are not used. So there is research uh, nowadays to try to in integrate this information, which are the fact that the land cover has not only a spectral behavior, but also a spatial and a temporal behavior. What do I mean? Uh, spatial behavior, let me just take an example. Uh, if, um, for instance, if I have a field of corn, a uh, very large uh, 10 hectares uh, of pure corn, and inside this field, I have uh, uh, a few pixels identified as uh, uh, sunflower, I will think that this is an error, okay? Because uh, the landscape, the agricultural landscapes uh, has some uh, um, coherency, some, there is some intelligence in the organization of uh, both natural and human landscapes so that uh, um, it's not possible to see anything. The, the organization of the landscapes is not random. And if, some, if I see something uh, strange, very, very strange in terms of spatial distributions, then uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's possible to identify some, some, some errors based, based on spatial, uh, spatial uh, inconsistencies. And temporal inconsistencies, it means that in this case, uh, I will consider the immediate, uh, the instantaneous characteristic of the ground, but uh, to, uh, 
two land covers which have the same characteristics today, probably next month will be different. They can be similar today and not next month. So there is a temporal dimension, which is not uh, often not taken into, into account. And I would like to illustrate these possibilities. Uh, the special behaviors, uh, to illustrate this uh, here, it means that we can use texture, shapes, topology, which, which is the geometry of connections between the neighboring uh, objects. So just let me take two examples. On the left, I have two, neighbor, two neighborhoods of the same city, which is uh, Rio, de, uh, Rio, de, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And if you look at, the two, at these two neighborhoods, in both cases, we, in this case, it's visible images of high resolution in, in both cases, the dominant color is gray. Okay? This gray, uh, I put this gray with a PowerPoint. I did not uh, compute it. But just to say that uh, in between these two uh, neighborhoods, I don't really have a very, very big difference to show that here I have a very rich neighborhood uh, near the Ipanema uh, beach. And here I have a typical favela uh, on, the, on, the hills, uh, on the hills of this big city. So I have the same color because it's, uh, it's not very, very different materials. But in this case, it's the texture, the shape of the object, the, or the spatial organization of the landscape, which is very different. And that will indicate that, OK, it's a city. OK, it's urban area. But if I want to say more about this urban area, it's to distinguish be between two very different neighborhoods, which I think is very meaningful for many users. So I have to consider something else and not only the spectral signature. And in this other example, this is mangrove, a very, very homogeneous forest, which, uh, which uh, grows uh, in the sea, in the, um, the mud and the, on the seaside. And here I have an old mangro uh, adult mangrove with very high trees. And here I have a very young mangrove. There is nothing uh, last year. And this year I have very, very small tree, very, it's very dense. And once again, if I only consider spectral signature, I can say that in both cases, I have more or less the same green, the same dominant green, so that if I want to distinguish these two kinds of landscape, we don't have the same future in terms of uh, uh, ecological processes, then I have to consider something else and not only spectral signature, in this case, the texture. So considering texture, say, shape, topology, and so on, uh, this is called geobia. Obia is object-based image analysis. And Geobia, because we are speaking of geographic uh, information. So this is, a, uh, this is a, uh, a branch of remote sensing uh, where people try to, uh, to consider some other uh, object properties and not only uh, spectral properties at, spe at pixel level. So other example here, uh, this is a Brazilian state, very rural state of Tocantins. And here there is a zoom which shows that uh, an automatic uh, classification of the shape of the object show that we don't have the same patterns of the landscapes. And uh, some people uh, who knows the, 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 uh, the topic much better than I do, uh, identified uh, some typical shapes of different kinds of agriculture, which can expand be, uh, depending on the market. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, beef and, and, uh, and milk and... Uh, and uh, soya beans or different, uh, different products, different economical productions uh, can, um, can lead to some uh, increase, some uh, spatial increase of a typical agri agricultural landscape dedicated to this particular kind of culture. Another example here, uh, this is in French Guiana. I, I take here, an, uh, for, this is sat not satellite, this is uh, airborne, uh, airborne remote sensing. Here we have the city of Remir, which is a very, uh, which was built more than one century ago. And here we have the typical uh, shape of uh, orthogonal streets, okay, with uh, right angles. So that this is what the typical shape one century ago, and after one century, there is some disorder. It was very ordered, and there was some disorder after one century because people uh, changed the, the, the position of the houses, they, they increased the size of their houses, they cut the vegetation, the neighbor did not cut, cut vegetation, uh, and so on. There are a lot of transformation in terms of, of land administration. So that I, we have an old pattern that was uh, more or less destroyed um, a long time. Here we have a residential neighborhood of, I would say, uh, the upper mid middle class. People who have uh, large houses, uh, swimming pools, and so on. So they buy, uh, they buy a, a terrain, 
and they build uh, their own house. So uh, the order, this is there is a great order in terms of uh, terrain of, of land land sharing, okay, land um, land market. But the, the the house, the size and the position of the house is something individual. There is some freedom in the choice, so that uh, we don't have a perfect order. Here we have a new neighborhood. Clearly, somebody brought and built and sold something already built. So that you have something perfectly symmetrical. And here, this is a favela. This is a favela. This was built without any authorization. So in the official, uh, now it's not, it's no longer true, but a few, a few years ago in the, um, in the urbanism document, in the official document uh, of the, uh, the administration, there was nothing here because uh, the administration did not, did not want to, to know what was going on. So you can see that from the streets, it was not possible to see the houses because so there were some trees here. And this is totally irregular. So that uh, in many cases, as I show in uh, Rio de Janeiro, in many cases, the, the physical pattern, the geometrical pattern of the urban landscapes is, gives a very interesting indication of what, what is the social profile of the people who are living in a given neighborhood. So this is very, very, uh, this is very clear. And obviously, as already commented, I'm not able, uh, I'm not able to, to, to define the kind of pattern I have for each kind of uh, society and reproduce the same pattern to another continent. I can apply the same uh, intellectual behavior, the intellectual uh, approach, but I'm, I'm, I really, uh, I must redefine my models in order to be able to make some, uh, some good interpretation. Uh, the other limitation of a spectral signature concept is that it's instantaneous. The land cover map, uh, which is instantaneous, uh, does not consider the temporal behavior. So uh, I just want to show an example here based on, uh, on an indicator. It is not a direct measurement. It's a combination of measurements. Here I have spectral signature. I have, here I have the red uh, wavelength. Here I have infrared. And there is a very classical indicator called uh, normalized vegetation index, which is uh, infrared minus red divided by infrared plus red. So it just uh, used to say that when this index is very high, we are clearly in presence of vegetation. So if this index is interesting to, to um, this is not a measurement, it's derived from measurement. It's not even a parameter on the ground that I could measure on the ground. I cannot measure this on the ground but it's an indication of vegetation density and vegetational health in, ter in terms of photosynthesis. If I look uh, at two, uh, two cultures, uh, wheat and corn, I can see that for both of them, I have a typical, this is uh, winter wheat and this is summer corn. I have a typical uh, uh, temporal behavior of this NDVI. Uh, you can see that between the two years, uh, this is a real measurement. Between the two years, I don't have exactly the same behavior. So this, it may be interesting to make the, for instance, the, the average between two, four, or two, three, or four years to have something more consistent. And this, is, this shows that if I have uh, a measurement, the NDVD measurement just at one date, I will lose all this information, which is very, uh, very, very interesting. So uh, just to give uh, some illustration in, uh, in some uh, cultures, this, well, this is work made by CESBIO uh, in some experimental areas. These are the spectral signatures of corn and sunflower uh, for two dates of the year, here in May and here in uh, September. I can see here, here that over, uh, over the spectrum, these are only a, a point measurement over the spectrum uh, related to the Sentinel-2 uh, spectral bands. And I can see that here, uh, corn and sunflower have, have very, very similar uh, behaviors in terms of spectral signature. It means that at the end of May, I will, I will have a very important confusion, uh, an important risk of confusion between these two cultures. And it seems that um, in other dates of the summer, I may have more chance to uh, distinguish, uh, distinguish uh, for have, to have a better land cover, uh, distinguish between these two cultures. And if I show uh, different cultures here, I put five different cultures uh, with corn, uh, barley, rapeseed, and sulfur. So I, I have crops that uh, don't have the same calendar. Uh, here I have typical winter, uh, winter uh, crops and here summer crops. I can see that, for instance, uh, here, uh, 
uh, sunflower and rapeseed have exactly the same behavior in terms of NDVI. So if I just have a measurement on this day, uh, the day number one, uh, 180 of the year, I don't know exactly when this is, maybe the end of, uh, the end of June or beginning of June. At this date, I will not be able to distinguish these different, uh, these different uh, crops. So the fact that I may have, I may access due to some high temporal resolution satellites, if I can access the whole, the whole uh, year annual cycle, I will have more chance to, 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 to produce a more reli reliable land cover map. But for this, I must access to high, resolu high temporal resolution and I wanted to mention a few satellites that have been uh, specifically designed to provide a high temporal resolution. For instance, Sentinel-1 um, is 20, uh, 12 days, but I have two satellites on the same orbit so that they share the, 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 they share the period and it's possible to have uh, one information every six days. Sentinel-2, which is optical, one information every five days, and Venus, which is a Fran uh, Franco-Israeli satellite every two days. So it's possible uh, in some cases uh, even to avoid the, the clouds because if I, have, if I have a cloud today and I have an information, a better information next week, uh, it's not so, it's not so uh, critical as uh, waiting for two or, th or three months. Uh, just to show that um, almost all possible temporal resolutions are available on, in existing on-orbit satellites. Uh, I show here three examples that are uh, used in the monitoring of hurricanes and their impacts. Here, uh, to, to monitor the trajectory into the, the, the path of the hurricane here in the, in the Caribbean Sea, uh, I need to have an image maybe every 15 or 30 minutes, and this exists. Uh, to show the, the, fluid, uh, the fluid area uh, in the next days after the, the, after the, 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 the event, uh, Sentinel-1 every six days, as shown in the, pre the previous slide. So this exists. And uh, to map, to, to evaluate the consequences uh, and organize the, the rescue uh, operation and re reconstruction, maybe one image, uh, one, one year old image is sufficient to know what, uh, what was the urban organization, the agri agricultural organization. I, I don't need to have an image taken uh, last week, for instance. So uh, the existing observation satellites offer all uh, very large variety of temporal resolution. And just to show a few applications, here I have an, ex uh, an example showing the benefit of high temporal resolution for the monitoring of deforestation is here in Southeast Asia. And there are similar works in Amazonia where I can see here on the right, the, the date indicating as a color, which means that for the government, for instance, I can monitor the deforestation and uh, compare the, the actual deforestation with what was uh, supposed to, 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 to happen uh, based on the authorization so that I have the space, uh, the, the, the special pattern of the deforestation. And typically here, there, are, uh, um, there is industrial uh, agriculture with authorized deforestation. And here there is a small random and um, probably not authorized deforestation. So this is, this is an information that shows the calendar of the deforestation process. Uh, another example is for uh, crop monitoring. This is an example of, of uh, rice, uh, rice crop in the in southeast in the Mekong Delta. So with the radar imagery like uh, Sentinel One, it's possible to correlate uh, the response of the radar, the the, the radar measurement, uh, with uh, to see the evolution of the radar measurement across uh, the calendar, the agricultural calendar, and to relate the um, the, 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 the the evolution of this measurement with the different uh, stages of the rise. And then based on this correlation, uh, it's possible to make a map uh, of the different uh, stages. And then uh, this is one date. And I, I show here four different dates across the year. And this was, uh, this was used to, um, to, uh, to show the evolution uh, in both uh, over time and over space. And this was used for two problems. One is a political problem, which was the decision to move from two cycles to three cycles, because it seemed that in Vietnam, some, um, I'm not the best specialist of this, but I heard that some politicians are trying to encourage the farmers to 
move from two, uh, two cycles in the year to three cycles. It has pros and benefits and, and, and disadvantages. So this kind of, uh, of work provided some information. And the other one is to compare this cycle from one year to another and to see some uh, climatic, uh, climatic change. And uh, the effect of El Nino, for instance, was evidenced with this kind of, uh, of uh, work uh, compared from one year to another. Uh, just to see, uh, to come back to geophysical uh, parameter, I wanted to show the benefit of high temporal resolution. There is a technique that I, I mentioned very, very briefly last week, which is called radar interferometry, uh, which consists in processing two radar images in a very particular way using the, the signal phase and the, 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 um, the difference of the two images compute in a very particular way uh, shows um, the... Um, deformation of the ground surface between two dates. So between two dates, we have here the, the, the Pito de la Fournaise, which is the main volcano at the La, la Réunion Island. And we can see here a very intense uh, deformation, which is in the, uh, an indicator of a future, uh, near future eruption. And here, this is the uh, subsidence that uh, happened a few, years, a few years ago in Paris, um, based on the, due to the, the, the Building the construction of the, the last uh, the last uh, um, underground line, the metro line. So uh, this is uh, every fringe is about uh, three centimeters subsidence. So this information is interesting, provided that we have the images at the right time. If you have one image a year, for instance, it's not very possible. But the satellites I've mentioned just earlier uh, are interesting because they provide uh, uh, nowadays um, sufficient uh, temporal uh, uh, temporal resolution. To be so that we are able to make this kind of processing. And uh, also the direct interpretation of these images is uh, interesting across time. This is an example, uh, in, this is in Cayenne again. When I show here, uh, five years apart, five years apart, uh, here we have the city, uh, the suburb of Cayenne, and here we have a favela that was constructed very quickly in a place where building houses is, is, uh, is not allowed, it's prohibited. So it's interesting to, uh, to have uh, uh, images very often to be able to see uh, uh, the evolution of the city, which is not, which, which is not uh, taken into account in official uh, urbanism documents. Uh, other example here, it's the suburb, the, the, the far suburb of Toulouse. And I took this, this region to illustrate a phenomenon that uh, people of this region know quite well, is that uh, the, the western suburb of Toulouse uh, has an urban growth which is directly related to the, uh, to the airbus uh, activity. So the, the aeronautical market uh, creates um, employment and every time Airbus signs a contract to build, uh, for instance, uh, 100 aircraft, so they need uh, engineers and uh, uh, any kind of staff. So these people need uh, houses and uh, uh, the history of Airbus is closely linked to the, the geographic history of the suburb of uh, the, the western suburb of Toulouse, where people uh, have to build houses. So this is an I, I'm not ob obviously I'm not able to, to be sure that these people work at Airbus, but uh, there is a clear correlation between the market of the the airplane market, uh, air, aircraft building market, and uh, the urbanization of the western suburb of Toulouse. So this, this kind of, uh, of evolution can be seen everywhere in, everywhere in the world. Uh, this is another example. This is Kourou. Uh, you will have the space center here in the recent uh, photograph. And here in 1954, maybe, you can see that there is just a wetland, a natural wetland. This is the street, uh, the, the road coming from Cayenne. There is no bridge. And we just have a fisherman village here with a few tens of people. So obviously, uh, this is very different because the, de the decision to build the space center was in the 60s. And in the 50s, there was nothing, just a uh, natural uh, environment. And this is very interesting because, uh, for instance, when the space center decides to build a new, a new equipment, uh, they can use all uh, old information to have the background, what, uh, what is called the background in ecology is the situation before the beginning of uh, important uh, urbanization or industrialization that we can know what, uh, what, what, what it was like uh, 50 years before or 70 years before in order to know what maybe how the, 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 the soil, the water, the vegetation will, re will react considering its natural, its natural behavior. 
Uh, another uh, interesting application is uh, for uh, judicial application. And this is an example uh, that shows that uh, remote sensing that can be used for usurpation, which is the acquisition of property through long and indisturbed process of the, of the land. So uh, this text is in French. Uh, uh, those of you who understand French can see that uh, there is a report from the judge, uh, uh, judge decision saying that uh, the, person, uh, the person seeking uh, for property uh, was providing photographs showing that uh, during uh, several, several decades, this, this family was using the land in a very uh, long and in disturbed condition. So uh, based on this, in France, it's uh, 30 years. Every country, each country of the world have a different law for usucapion and uh, indicates how, how long you have to be, uh, you have to use a, a, a terrain uh, to be allowed to become the owner. And then uh, all photographs are interesting because, because they can show, uh, they can show that before a given date, you were not using this land, but after a given date, you began to use this land and to, uh, to build something to, uh, to, cultivate, to cultivate and so on. And speaking of land administration, uh, Oh, sorry, this is another way. If you don't have old photographs, uh, if you don't have old photographs, you can also see in modern photographs uh, or here orchard and vineyard, uh, which are uh, old plantation. And if you have an orchard here, it means that uh, you already had it 10 years ago because this is not something that grows very, very quickly. Same from vineyard. And uh, back to land administration. I want to show that there is a there is some there are some dis discussions in the in the profession worldwide to discuss on the possibility of uh, of using the images instead of the ground in cell itself to put some landmarks and to make some uh, some delimitation and uh, in this example if I consider for instance this uh, this parcel this agricultural parcel which uh, belongs probably to this farm and probably was uh, the, the, the fusion, the merging of different, this parcel and this one and this one. So uh, a land, uh, land surveyor will have to uh, put some, so this is the parameter of this parcel. A land surveyor will have to put some marks on the ground. So uh, to be able to, 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 to model this, uh, this land parcel with a reasonable number of marks, it's very difficult to include all details. So that this is just to show that the images is able to provide the details that the land surveyor is not able to uh, model with uh, physical landmarks. So there is a, there are discussions at the international level to be uh, to try to propose uh, based on uh, not only satellite but also on drones, uh, UAVs, uh, to use images to store the the information and to, to to put the landmark not on the ground but on the on the digital image. So this is an, an example, for instance, in Africa, where uh, a French uh, non-governmental governmental organization uh, contributed to a uh, land administration reform uh, program to share the land between people. And the, the sharing was made uh, on the satellite image, as shown here, bit before, uh, before making it on the ground. So this is a way uh, satellite images can be, uh, can be used, I would say, to... Uh, to avoid conflicts, uh, maybe, because uh, people who have the, the images on the, on the screen maybe can discuss uh, before going to the ground. And to finish with, I would like, I want, just wanted to show how all this is implemented in a practical work, working environment, which is the geographic information system, which uh, for the last 20 or 30 years has been the universal way to, to, to manage uh, digital geographic information which is a system in which you have a georeference database. It means that all the information, in all the information, its object or pixel uh, is uh, referenced in a, uh, in a given cartographic system. Uh, there are special analysis tools in order to, to ask some question to the, to the database and some graphical tools. Um, a limitation of the geographical information systems is that uh, it's uh, really inspired from the paper generation in which the cartographer uh, was used to design parcel with the graphical uh, graphical means, and then uh, a GIS, a geographic geographical information system, 
uh, it works very well with segmented landscape with uh, with this kind of pattern, a segmented landscape with uh, uh, homogeneous parcels with discontinuous boundaries, rather than uh, in this kind of homogeneous uh, landscape in the wet tropic, which is not very uh, easy to model in uh, in this kind of uh, environment. And this case is very often uh, necessary to reason at, to, at, the, um, at the pixel level, to, to consider one pixel as uh, one object, so this is very, very heavy. And uh, the images in the GIS, the images has a particular role. So I have to say here that the images are not able to be processed in the GIS uh, before pre-processing, which is auto rectification, which means that uh, using the input image and uh, some data, some uh, acquisition parameters, which is the position of the satellite and some uh, information about the sensor and the satellite, as well as an important information, which is a digital elevation model, which is a relief map, a map in which I, I know for each pixel of the image, what is the altitude, because the altitude, it says what is the deformation of the image. Thanks to all these parameters, I'm able to, to bring each pixel of the image, which is not in the proper position, to brought it to the proper position and to have, to resample the image in order to have uh, an author image, which is the image which is which can be exactly superimposed to a map. So this kind of product, the author image, author photo map, uh, has the radiometry of an image, which means the color, the texture, and so on. It is an image, but uh, from a geometrical point of view, it is rigorously a map. You can you have the north, uh, uh, the north direction. You have a, a cartographic projection uh, defined, and so on. So this is. Uh, the, the basic product which is used and uh, generally this product is not enough to be not sufficient to cover the, the, the interesting area which is may which may be even a whole country so it's necessary to make some mosaicing i don't have time to, ex to explain what is the difficulty of mosaicing uh, these auto images but the result is a mosaic in which the work is done um, and the result is that uh, at the moment uh, nowadays um, after um, the development in the, in the past of uh, processing tools that are able to uh, automatically auto-rectify images, there are in the internet, as everybody knows now, there are uh, auto images. Uh, the, Google, the Google Earth, for instance, is not a rigorous auto image. Uh, in, and uh, if you look at the conditions, there is no guarantee about geometric uh, quality. But this is example uh, in France of the National uh, Mapping Agency, uh, IGN, uh, with the Geoportail. And uh, you have, uh, on, in France, the, the Geoportail gives you a um, north photo mosaic with the 50 centimeter, uh, 50 centimeter resolution. And if you compare the, this information, which has no explicit information, all is implicit. If you compare it with the cadastral map, for instance, from the, the, the Ministry of, uh, of Finances, uh, the cadastral map uh, says uh, is um, one layer of the geographic information system in which you can found, find who is the owner of the, uh, of the parcel number uh, 72 and so on. So here you have some graphical information and this connects to some uh, databases with the name of the owner and so on. Um, what I want to show here is that uh, the, 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 the map on the right requires some, I would say, some technical skills, some professional culture, uh, which is not uh, accessible to everybody. On the left, you have an image which can be uh, easy to understand for a child or a person uh, who never went to school, has no, uh, no uh, school education or university education. So in many cases, in, in many places of the world where, where they had some some conflicts about land administration, it can be observed that the use of satellite imagery has helped a lot to, uh, to negotiate, I would say negotiate with, uh, maybe not with no conflict, but uh, let's be realistic, but with less, with less conflict. So this is a very interesting uh, property of the images that is that uh, within the geographic information system, there are several layers of information, cadastral map, geological map, and all a lot of information and the photo, the aerial photograph, I, as I see here, photograph and cadastral map. If I remove the photograph, it will be difficult for many people 
recognized to identify their parcel. If I put here the, 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 the photograph, uh, beyond the role, the role of the photograph as information, as a source of information, it's also a source of visual, a way of visualization, uh, which can be used for people who are not uh, familiar with the, with the technical aspects of this matter. So I think this was the, the conclusion of my presentation. And uh, we have uh, nearly 15 minutes for, for questions on this presentation or the, previ the previous one last week, or even on no other aspects of uh, remote sensing that I forgot to, to mention. Thank you, Laurent. We have some questions already on the NDVI. Okay. So, Berk, uh, Octem, maybe if you'd like to start, if we can unmute you. Yeah, thank you. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes perfect. So, I just want to know, uh, I'm working on coffee, and uh, uh, I want to know if I can use NDVI for separating coffee areas from uh, forest areas. Uh, is it uh, because I saw some articles and apparently it's a bit more complicated? Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Okay. Uh, NDVI, you understand that in the NDVI, I put it here, it's just one value. And here you have the whole spectrum. So I spoke of the limitation of the spectrum, but at least the spectrum is some, uh, contains a lot of information, which is the, the behavior of your, the cafe crop or the forest or all, all wavelengths. So that the spectral signature is a richer information than the, the single NDVI. The, the advantage of the NDVI is that you can uh, assign it to one pixel, to each pixel, and produce a map of NDVI. So that on, on the map, you can be uh, interested in trying to identify coffee parcels and forest parcels. Now, if, uh, if uh, coffee uh, and, and forest have the same NDVI, what you can do can be either uh, Choosing other, other wavelengths from the same satellite or from another satellite, maybe red. Sometimes you have two or, two or three red uh, spectral bands or two or three infrared spectral bands. So try others. Uh, I mean, slightly modify the NDVI definition to, be, to, to, to see if some wavelengths is more sensitive to the difference between coffee and forest. Uh, <coughs> also look at the texture. Look at the texture because sometimes I've shown for mangrove that the young and adult mangrove have the same color, but different textures. So maybe the forest, you have large crowns of the coffee, the coffee crop. So you may have, for instance, the, the shadow, uh, the shadow uh, on the border of a, of a parcel, uh, the forest will project a shadow and not the coffee. Uh, just, uh, just a problem you may have for coffee is that uh, I don't know in which part of the world you are study, making this study, but coffee in some places of the world is in mountainous areas. And the problem of the mountainous areas is that you may have the same crop on two sides of a mountain, two sides of a hill, and they don't have in, a sing, in the same satellite ima image, they don't have the same illumination. For instance, an image uh, in the morning, you may have uh, the, coffee, the, the, the same coffee crop uh, illuminated on the east uh, side of the hill and nearly in the shadow, at least darker on the west side. And in this, in this case, your, the, your classification, even a good classification with the good training sample may create a difference which does not, does not exist on the ground. This is one of the limitations I've shown uh, concerning the, the, the acquisition conditions, the position of the sun. And then there's a question from Ismael. Uh, Ismael Yakubujima, also about the NDVI. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. So um, my question is about using NDVI uh, to detect areas that use um, that where there is irrigation, and I'm thinking of of the Sahel uh, of the Sahel, where uh, typically farmers you uh, rely on rainfall. So I was wondering if using NDVI and maybe the temporal variation over time can 
is a reliable way to kind of to detect places where uh, people will be using irrigation. Um, yes. There are many studies uh, also in France huh, to detect, uh, to, to, lo to, to locate uh, irrigated, irrigated agriculture uh, using NDVI and, uh, and other combination of uh, optical bands. I can also suggest radar imagery, uh, which nowadays can be accessed free of charge with, uh, from Sentinel-1, which is a satellite from the European Space Agency. I've shown the rice, uh, an image of the rice crop uh, from Sentinel-1. It's very, very sensitive to uh, to the difference between uh, uh, a parcel which is underwater and the parcel which is uh, just uh, wet, uh, just wet, and the parcel which is dry, so radar imagery can be a, a good a good uh, option too. Okay, thank you. The floor is free for other questions. <laughs> And you can uh, just uh, raise your hand or write in the chat. So, so maybe I go with a question. Like, uh, so, so here we see that, like, we have pixels which are clearly identified. But of course, like a given pixel may be a mix between different things because, like, a field may be like you may have a field and a forest, and like for some pixels you will have half of both. For other pixels, you will have. Uh, one third of one and two thirds of the other. And, and so I wonder whether it is possible basically to uh, uh, have an idea of which pixel is a mix and which pixels are kind of pure. And uh, like related to that, I wonder if it is possible to, to spot like for instance roads, which may be thinner than a pixel, but very long. Uh, and which means that they would, it would be a mix on many, many pixels, but possibly the same kind of mix. Yes, there are many possibilities. I would just uh, uh, say a few words about the main one, the main uh, most uh, popular and, uh, and reliable ones. Um, one is to merge, uh, for instance, if I have uh, an optical image like, like um, um, Landsat or Sentinel-2 or Spot, uh, optical image with... Uh, for instance, two, two, uh, 20 meter pixel size. 20 meter uh, for very, very large uh, uh, cultivated fields, it's, it's okay. You have some uh, uh, fuzzy uh, pixels in the, in the borders, but it's okay for most pixels. For small pixels, it's very difficult to, to work with them. So in this case, one possibility is to merge this image with an, an image for another sensor, which may have typically a higher resolution, but a poor spectral uh, quality. Uh, generally, for for reasons related to the to the, the, the the energy balance of the sensor, for technical reasons, I would say, uh, generally the highest uh, resolution, uh, the highest resolution are not compatible with a very very thin, very rich spectral uh, resolution. So that means you may have some sensors with a high resolution and very very few spectral bands, or just one, which are called panchromatic. In this case, there are techniques that can may be used to merge uh, both images and to inject in the in the rich color image uh, the the the, 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 spa the spatial resolution of the other sensor. So this is a possibility, but these algorithms are not perfect. It means that you simulate to some extent you simulate the, the pixels that you would have would from a sensor that would have the spectral characteristics of one sensor and the spatial characteristic of the other one. But this merging is not perfect. It makes, it makes some, uh, some hypotheses that are not always true. So that uh, the results is, is better, but not perfect. Another solution is that with, you say you, you remain with the, 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 the medium resolution sensor. And if you know, for instance, that uh, in, your, in the region you are mapping, there are, uh, for instance, uh, five kinds uh, of um, surfaces, the five main kind of surfaces uh, uh, occupying 99% uh, of, the, sur of the, the, the total area. If you have the spectral, if you know the spectral signature of these five, uh, five, uh, five kinds of surfaces, you can make some, uh, there is a possibility to, um, to implement an algebraic uh, solution. Uh, you have uh, five unknowns, which are the, percent the percentage of the five 
crops of the five kinds of surface within your pixel. You know that it's potentially the mixture of five, uh, five potential objects or surfaces, but you don't know how many, how much uh, of each, uh, each surface. So that you have five uh, unknowns, but you know the spectral signature of each surface. So you have, uh, you have a system. If you have five, at least, if you have at least five wavelengths, measurements in five wavelengths, so that you have a system when you have with, with five equations and five unknowns. So in this case, it's possible to mathematically uh, solve this system and to try to identify the, the, the contribution of, uh, of, each, uh, of each pixel. However, in this case, you will not be able to say what is the spatial distribution of these uh, contributors within the pixel. You will not say if there are, uh, well, you will not know about the texture. You will not know if it's a very thin texture or if you have uh, just a, a part of the pixel of one crop and another part of another crop, like on the border of two parcels. So you will not, you will not know this. And another approach, uh, I will just tell, will tell you a, a third one, is, uh, is that the medium resolution is, can be interesting for, uh, for some applications. The problem is that many times, um, theoretically, you should make a land, use, uh, a land use map, a land cover map, based on the requirements of somebody, of the, the client or the, the okay, some, some, somebody requires the, this, these products and uh, has a list of surfaces uh, that are supposed to be, uh, to be identified. The problem is that most often the, the company that will, go, that will do the processing will say, oh, with my sensor, I'm not able to distinguish between this and this. And then the, uh, the client of, often has to adapt the nomenclature of, uh, of, uh, of land cover to the capabilities of the sensor. So this is, this is very often the case, but is, this is not correct be more correct to adapt the sensor. So if we don't adapt the sensor, uh, if the, the nomenclature is adapted to the sensor, uh, I think the best solution is to modify the, not only the choice of the parcels, but their names. Because uh, geographers um, are used to name the, 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 the objects or the, the landscape they observe. And if you have, for instance, uh, urban area, if I have a pixel of uh, 30 by 30 meters, I will name the class, for instance, residential area. The other one, I will name favela. But if I have a pixel with one by one meter, I will, I'm not able to distinguish a residential area of a favela. I will see a roof, some grass, uh, some asphalt, uh, a car, a uh, park, and so on. So the different resolutions do not see the same thing. And the most correct approach will be to change totally the name of the things we are, we are, we are looking at. In the forest, uh, I can see some peaks, some high resolution sensors can show every tree. So uh, heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous sorry, forest, uh, you will have a map with different kinds of trees uh, appearing in the classification. If you have a medium resolution or low resolution, you will give a name to the kind of forest you have. You will say, you will call it heterogeneous forest. Okay, so this is the, there are different ways to, to, to deal with your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Irene, maybe? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, your intervention. Uh, I had a question on, uh, because you were talking about planned and unplanned construction, and I was wondering if you think it would be possible to distinguish uh, artisanal and industrial mining uh, like artisanal mining implemented nearby um, industrial ones, for example, within a certain uh, radius. And if you had any uh, idea of uh, papers or researchers who had already uh, studied this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been working myself in, in gold mining, gold washing in, in French Guyana, which is a great problem. And uh, we have seen the evolution. Clearly, it's, a, it's easy to, to distinguish between artisanal and this, uh, industrial. Um, it's interesting to have the map of the, the concession, the, the authorized uh, implementations to compare, because generally industrial is something more, uh, will, more respectful of the, the authorization, and artisanal is not always the case. 
So this is only one criteria, but I know that artisanal, artisanal mining can be very regular too. And uh, you don't have the same structure, the same texture, the same way of uh, uh, the organization of the landscape around the mining is different. So you know, unfortunately, nobody will be able to give a universal answer to your question saying uh, artisanal is organized this way and the industrial is organized this way. But with, with a rather high resolution, you will be clearly able to distinguish different kinds of, of mining activities. And uh, people who know quite well about this kind of activity will even tell you how it's, uh, how it's being implemented um, in terms of pollution and uh, is it respectful uh, to uh, environmental procedures and so on. So this is, this is clear. And, uh, and the variety of sensors with the Considering the varieties of sensors we have nowadays, and not 30 years ago, it's clearly, clearly the case. Okay, thank you very much. So now I think, do you have another question, Mark? Yeah, just a quick one, uh, if you let me. So sure. it's just, do you have any suggestion for satellite-based temperature data at fine spatial resolution. I know MODIS satellite, but uh, I think it's not uh, directly applicable. They use some machine learning techniques to use MODIS satellite. But if you have some any temperature data that you can suggest, it will be great. MODIS, MODIS is clearly a low resolution sensor, uh, which has the advantage of uh, providing very, images very often. So there is a trade-off between the resolution and the temporal resolution. Uh, the good trade-off are uh, with Landsat. Uh, Landsat has one uh, channel in the thermal infrared and uh, Sentinel-3. Uh, Sentinel-1 is radar, Sentinel-2 is uh, op optical and Sentinel-3 has a th uh, thermal information. So you, you have nowadays uh, medium resolution. They are never, uh, thermal, thermal uh, infrared is never uh, available with such a high resolution as you have in the optical domain. Because the, the energy the sensor receives in the uh, thermal spectrum is very low, so it's necessary to integrate this energy over a wider spectral band. Otherwise, you, you would have very, very poor uh, images in terms of uh, radiometric quality. But uh, look at Sentinel and look at Landsat uh, thematic map. Uh, Landsat, uh, I don't know the name, of the name of the last one, but the, the last generation of Landsat uh, provides a correct uh, thermal infrared information, but you will have heat emission. From heat emission to temperature, it's one, it's another problem. It's very easy on the ocean because the ocean is very homogeneous, but in the continental landscapes, when you have different kinds of vegetation, soil, water, uh, cities, and so on, uh, transforming heat emission measured by the satellite into temperature is something that is not so, so straightforward. Thank you. So maybe we should wrap up unless there is a last question. Because <laughs> then I'd like to leave the word to Francois to announce the future conferences. And we should also thank Laurent Polidori. This has been really interesting. I think most people would like to chat further with you. <laughs> we hope we can invite you maybe uh, later on at PC in person. That would be nice. Yeah, so uh, I also want to thank you and uh, for two uh, very interesting presentations. And I hope, uh, like at least for me, uh, very insightful. And I think it was also the case for many uh, of the people who attended the talk. Um, just a an, an, uh, general comment, like the next session will be in April, on um, April 12th and April 15th, so a Monday and a Thursday from 9.30 to uh, 11 uh, a.m. Uh, and it's going to be a water cycle. It's going to be uh, basically three hours by Vincent Allais, who's an hydrogeologist, and who's going to talk like the first session will be on the quality of water, uh, sorry, on the quantity of water available. The, the second session will be more focused on the quality of water and, uh, and on, of course, on the trade-offs between uh, uh, quantity and quality. Uh, so, like, we're going to go down from the sky towards the Earth, but uh, there will be some connections. Uh, uh, so, thank you all for attending, and uh, hopefully uh, see you very soon, like in this uh, masterclass or in PSE.